Hello and welcome to you, Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevard Natsa. The war on terror, democracy building and regime change stopping humanitarian crisis does international interference ever solve the problems it's targeting? And is there really anything humanitarian in humanitarian interventions? Well, today I speak to author and associate professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Alan J. Cooperman is my guest today. From Kosovo to Afghanistan, through Iraq to Libya, Western troops come in as saviors, all too often leaving blood and chaos behind. Is it possible to bomb nations into democracy and prosperity? Can nation building be done with missiles and tanks? But what's exactly humanitarian about a military intervention? Alan Cooperman, author, associate professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us today. Now, as Hillary Clinton, the then U.S. Secretary of State, put it, we came, we saw, he died. Now, she was obviously talking about the toppling of Gaddafi and the Libyan bombing campaign. Now, can you really just drop some bombs, give out arms, and then leave? Is that what passes for a victory? Oh no! It's 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 as as I've written. It's 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 a total disaster. Um, it's been bad for Libya, and it's bad also for the United States and its allies, and for the rest of the world. Uh, what we have is a worsening of the humanitarian situation. The death toll has increased uh, by about ten times. We turned a state that was an ally in the war against terrorism into now a safe haven for terrorists, where both Al-Qaeda and ISIS roam. Uh, there's been proliferation of weapons, including surface-to-air missiles that can shoot down civilian airliners. There's spillover of war to Mali. Uh, no, it's been a total disaster. Also, NATO's recent interventions in general, they're justified as humanitarian. How can a military intervention be humanitarian? Bombing is not something humanitarian. Well, I actually think that uh, intervention can be humanitarian, and I think that um, but most we're talking about military of the interventions, interventions that NATO... Absolutely, military intervention. If there, for example, in uh, Rwanda, there was a genocide. In Cambodia, there was a genocide. If there had been military interventions, those interventions could have stopped the killers and saved lots of lives. There have been such interventions. For example, in um, East Pakistan in 1971, there was an intervention that stopped the genocide. There was intervention in Uganda when Idi Amin was killing people. So military intervention can save lives. Um, and, in fact, the NATO interventions, for example, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Libya, were motivated by a humanitarian impulse. The problem is that sometimes they backfire and they wind up uh, actually increasing the humanitarian suffering, increasing the death toll. Uh, and that's what happened in Libya. Like you uh, pointed out, if things were bad under Gaddafi, they're even worse now. I mean, Libya is a failed state today with warring factions tearing it further apart. Why doesn't anyone want to interfere now? Um, I think it's because it is a very dangerous place. And um, the West and NATO and the Arab League and the uh, Gulf, uh, GCC, I, those folks, I think, uh, were willing to have a easy intervention, which is what they thought was going to happen in 2011, that it would just be quick and they would topple Gaddafi and then we would get a new democratic state that would be pro-Western. Um, so that they were willing to do using just air power. And there were a few ground troops from Qatar, but uh, no uh, NATO uh, ground troops. Today, what we have is a renewed civil war in Libya. We have um, radical Islamic terrorists from Al-Qaeda and from ISIS. And so it would be a very dangerous place, to, for example, to put uh, NATO peacekeepers. There, there have been interventions. There have been interventions by Egypt and by UAE um, and by Turkey. Uh, 
But these interventions are actually on opposing sides in Libya's civil war. Uh, what there is not the stomach for is the deployment of a large ground force of peacekeepers. And so Libya is, as you characterized it correctly, it is a failed state uh, that's in the midst of civil war and includes safe haven for Islamic terrorists. Now, Gaddafi, by the early 2000s, he began working with the West and he started disarming, getting rid of the WMDs and curbing his new program. And a few years later, he's overthrown and killed. That's not a very encouraging reward for being cooperative, is it? No, it was, it was um, very ill-conceived. Um, it was one of the reasons that um, NATO should not have intervened uh, in Libya. Gaddafi had been a very bad actor for many decades. He had sponsored international terrorism. He had uh, sponsored rebels around the world that had started civil wars throughout Africa and elsewhere. Um, but he changed. Uh, he changed in around 2000. And then again in 2003, uh, when, the, when the U.S. led an intervention in Iraq, and Gaddafi said, I don't want to be the next target. And he gave up his uh, nuclear weapons program. He started cooperating even before that in the war against Al-Qaeda, because he was a target of Al-Qaeda. Uh, so in a sense, uh, NATO and Libya had a common enemy in Al-Qaeda. And they allied and shared intelligence uh, to try and uh, um, conduct the global war on terror. Uh, and so he was an ally of the West. And um, despite that, in 2011, um, the U.S. and NATO decided to intervene to overthrow him uh, and facilitate his being killed. And what that does is undermine uh, international nuclear nonproliferation policy, because what it says to anyone who has a WMD program is uh, if you have your program, then you can deter intervention against you. But if you give up your program, then at some moment in the future, uh, the international community may decide you need to go and you have no defense against it. And so it actually, this intervention in Libya will probably promote the spread of nuclear weapons and other WMD. So it's very ill-conceived and very unfortunate. And now the European Union is planning for an operation in Libya provoked by an uncontrollable stream of migrants there. And will the people trafficking operations be suppressed by military force, you think? And is this going to work? Um, it's a very dicey and controversial situation. It seems to be rather um, cold-hearted. And I think that uh, if you have migrants on a ship, and then you have uh, European military forces taking action against those ships, that there's going to be a big outcry in Europe that this uh, violates the spirit of um, uh, refugee, uh, refugees uh, conventions. And that uh, these folks may in fact have a well-founded fear of persecution in their home country. And so they deserve to have an interview to decide if they should get asylum. And they're not going to get that interview if what you're doing is uh, destroying the ships that they uh, want to get on to get asylum. So it may not formally violate any international law, but it violates the spirit of uh, allowing folks to seek asylum. And I think that especially in the left in Europe is going to be up in arms about mm -hmm. this. So it's, uh, I understand why they're thinking of pursuing it, but I'd be very surprised if it actually happens. Like you pointed out, the chaos Libya was plunged into after the NATO intervention turned it into a safe haven for Islamic State or other terrorist groups. So is waging a war against IS in Iraq and Syria no use until Libya is addressed as well? Uh, no, I don't think it should be the top priority uh, in, in, in the war on terror. If, if you study military strategy, the probably most famous strategist is a uh, German from the 19th century named Karl von Clausewitz. And uh, he always talked about going 
to the center of gravity of the enemy. And the center of gravity of ISIS is not in Libya. The center of gravity of ISIS is in Iraq and Syria. And that's where they're holding territory. That's where they are recruiting. That's where they are making money. That's where they are hatching plots uh, that could attack the West. And so that needs to be the, the focus, I think, of Western efforts. That being said, you don't want to have new safe havens. Uh, and so uh, Libya needs, the, the, the radicals in Libya also need to be contained. But I, want to, but I want to talk about, you know, taking action in the center of gravity. And I'm talking about action against ISIS in Iraq. The U.S. is saying the Iraqi army doesn't want to fight. And Iraq is saying it's not getting enough help from the U.S. Can the Iraqi army do without a foreign intervention at this point? Are ground troops necessary? Um, ground troops, for sure, are necessary to uh, contain and then defeat ISIS. The question is, whose ground troops? They could be uh, Iraqi ground troops. Um, but then the question is, which Iraqi ground troops? Will they be simply uh, Shiite Arabs? Uh, or will they include uh, Sunni Arabs, uh, as well as Kurds? So they could be Iraqi, or they could be Iranian, um, uh, or Iranian proxies, or they could be Western uh, troops. At the moment, we have a combination of all of those, and yet they're not succeeding. Um, and they're not succeeding uh, because they are not fighting together. Um, they're, not, they're not united. This is something where actually I, I think the Obama administration is one of the f maybe few areas where I agree with them that the key to victory is to get all of the Iraqi people across uh, ethnic and sectarian lines united. If they were united, then I think they could defeat ISIS rather quickly. Mr. Cooper, we're um, going to take a short break is, right however, now. We're going to continue talking about precisely that after okay. the break. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue talking to Alan Cooperman, okay. author and professor at the University of Texas, talking about what happens when international interventions go wrong. Stay with us. hidden stories, moving against the mainstream, going to all lengths to bring real news to Britain. I'm Afshin Ritatsi, going underground to bring you the stories that really matter, only on RT. Act to the USA Freedom Act. America's debate on government surveillance of citizens, thanks to Edward Snowden, has created some heat but hardly any light in American politics. NSA backers claim the new law is reform, but isn't it only a distinction without a difference?
And we're back with Alan Cooperman, author and professor at the University of Texas. Welcome back to the show. We're talking about international interventions and their often unforeseen results. So, uh, Professor, you've said in one of your interviews on the anti-ISIS effort, when Iraqis get their act together, think of themselves as Iraqis, not Sunnis or Shias, then we will come in. But ISIS is close to Baghdad now. Is there really time to wait? Well, it's it's uh, it's it's a very interesting game of chicken between um, uh, the Obama administration and the Iraqi government in Baghdad. Essentially, what Obama said, and I think he was correct to say this, is we want you Iraqis to unite before we will come in and help a lot in this war. And the reason is, if the U.S. or NATO just came in and helped a lot, then the Shiite-dominated government in Baghdad could say, fine, we'll just continue to oppress and ignore the Sunni, and the U.S. and NATO will help us do that. Uh, what, what would happen then is that the Sunni in Iraq would say, our only potential friends are ISIS, and they would join ISIS. And so it wouldn't defeat ISIS, it would actually bolster ISIS. And so what Obama said is to Baghdad, as they said, you Shiites in Baghdad, you need to share power with the Sunni. You need to provide them weapons. You need to incorporate them in your security forces. And when you folks are united, then you will be able to start to make progress against ISIS, and we will actually help you do that. Um, however, there are hardline Shiite um, Shiites in the government in Baghdad, and they are refusing so far to really share power or share weapons with the Sunni. And so the U.S. is therefore withholding uh, the full force of its intervention. And that's part of the reason that you saw ISIS make progress. And essentially what Obama is saying to Baghdad is ISIS is continue, will continue to make progress until you share power with the Sunni. So, and Baghdad is trying to basically blackmail uh, Washington and saying, oh, ISIS is about to defeat us. You better come in but, and do more airstrikes. But and everything so this, that we're talking about chicken. right now, everything that we're talking about right now, the ISIS, the Shias, the Sunnis, them being so fractured. I mean, the U.S. intervention in Iraq was what caused this mess in Iraq in the first place. So is it fair to say that United States troops, who ne they need to be there to do, to do the cleaning up right now? Because don't you think the U.S. sort of bears the responsibility? Well, you, one, one can think of two reasons why, why the U.S. Uh, and, and, and its allies should be there. One would be this ethical argument that uh, we broke it, and so we need to stick around to fix it. Uh, and the second, which I think is more realistic in terms of driving policy, is that the U.S. has an interest in Iraq not being a failed state, Iraq not being uh, a breeding ground for terrorists, and ISIS not having uh, a third or a half of a country where it can produce revenue, train uh, radical terrorists, and send them around the world to strike against uh, U.S. and Western interests. So whether it's ethics or whether it's self-interest, the U.S. Act absolutely has an interest in defeating ISIS. The question is how. And if the U.S. were to go in too heavily right now, I think what it would do is it would allow the Shiite-led government in Baghdad to continue ignoring uh, and oppressing and excluding the Sunni, and that would actually bolster ISIS. L let me tell you an interesting fact. Last week I spoke to Iraq's interior minister, and what he told me is that no one wants to see American troops in Iraq. I mean, he wants more help from America, but they don't want to see American troops in Iraq. Why is that, in your opinion? Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's a number of reasons. Um, uh, the, the Shiite militias that dominate Iraqi security forces um, were killing American troops the last time they were there. That was their raison d'etre. So um, if Americans come over there, they could be in the crosshairs. Uh, secondly, I don't think he was worried too much about the security of the American doesn't... forces when he was saying he doesn't want to see American troops on the ground. No, I, under I, mean, I understand that, but I'm, I'm explaining that, I'm explaining that, that um, it wouldn't be a new thing for these Iraqi forces to oppose Americans being there. They opposed them the entire time they, they were there. There, there are some folks who like the Americans being there. Those would be, for example, the Sunni moderates. Um, but those are the Sunni moderates that are being excluded right now from power and from weapons by the Iraqi government. So I was just trying to say that this is not new. 
The, the, the folks who don't want Americans to be there are the folks who always um, opposed Americans being there. They're the radical Shiites uh, associated with the government, and they're the ra radical Sunni that are now calling themselves ISIS or the Islamic State. So we also heard Ashton Carter say that he's very worried about Iran being involved in this operation against ISIS in Iraq. So Iran is actually at the forefront of international aid to Iraq against ISIS. And again, we see apprehension from the West about this role. Is this a pattern? Is intervening only okay when the West does it? I mean, Iranians are obviously helping to push out ISIS more than anyone else right now. I think, I think there is a view in, in Washington and in NATO that, uh, as you put it, intervention is only right when the U.S. or, or NATO does it. Um, you, you, you've seen the reaction to the deployment of Russian aid and Russian forces in Ukraine, and, uh, and the same thing in Georgia. And those two interventions are, in some ways, analogous to Western interventions in Kosovo uh, and in Bosnia and in Libya. And so, yes, I think that's, that's quite common that um, each country thinks its interventions are justified and um, um, enemy or rival countries, when they intervene, they're, they're not justified. Even but though you're fighting the, the same Iranian, cause. in terms of the Iranian intervention, uh, so in this case, in this case, it's very interesting because um, the U.S. and Iran have a common enemy uh, in ISIS. But um, the U.S. believes that if we defeat ISIS, then we'll go home. Whereas if Iran defeats ISIS, then Iran will essentially control Iraq as a um, as a um, not a vassal, not a tributary state, but as an extension of its regional power. So why not with work with Iran on it? I mean, they're certainly re working on a nuclear hegemony. treaty together. Why not work with Iran on a strategy to, to defeat ISIS together? Uh, you know, again, again, it's because I think that we have the common interest of defeating ISIS, but beyond that, we do not have common interests. President Obama has said in an interview that a more aggressive effort to rebuild Libyan society was needed to success, uh, for success. Um, tell me something, why does America see itself as world's carpenter contractor? I mean, going around rebuilding societies? Why the desire to nation build elsewhere, not at home, when, you know, I hear some major American politicians admit that, you know, their own system is broken and needs to be fixed? Well, I think that this really goes to the root of what America is. Um, uh, America has ideals that it feels are not simply for Americans, but that are universal. Um, these are ideals and of, of freedom, of liberty, uh, of, of the right of, of expression, uh, of the right um, to, to life, uh, and to uh, seek happiness. But don't and, you think like those um, ideals so are kind of left behind that the US would, for would now? Do things. Because I mean, don't you feel like America is a different place than where these ideals were <clears throat> like born or like when they were at its peak in the 70s or in the 80s? Because a country that has Baltimore and has like the biggest growing gap between poor and the rich, really, can they really go elsewhere and rebuild other societies where they really need to fix their own in the first place? Um, for, first of all, I would say that uh, America is still considered by the rest of the world the best place. Um, we have more people trying to come to America than are trying to go anywhere else on Earth. And so um, I think that's partially because of the economic success of America and partially these ideals that I, that I talked about. Um, that anybody can accomplish anything in America. Now, of course, this, this goes up and down over time, and, and we certainly have um, bad uh, uh, economic inequality uh, at the moment. But that doesn't change what America is and what, and what it is in people's minds. Secondly, in terms of the resources of America, uh, we still have incredible resources to try to help the rest of the world. Um, our economy is not shrinking. It, it is growing. Uh, it is bigger than it has ever been before. And we spend billions of dollars around the world, for example, doing foreign aid, democracy promotion. Um, now, it doesn't always work. 
um, sometimes backfires, but it is largely well-intentioned. So when you ask why does the U.S. want to be the world's carpenter or contractor, I think it is in our DNA. Uh, and it is especially in our DNA when there's a place that we've helped to break. Uh, we do have this, uh, what was known as, uh, I think, the China barn or pottery barn uh, policy by Colin Powell, the Secretary of State under our last president, which is, if you break it, you bought it. And so when we break a place like we broke Iraq or like we broke Afghanistan or like we broke Libya, I think that there is, uh, that we do feel this more moral responsibility to try to fix it if we can. Um, but then again, after a while, if we fail, um, then people get frustrated and tired. And I think that's what the Obama administration sort of represented. We were tired. We were, rep we were tired of trying to do what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, and so there was a pullout. Um, we were tired of these big interventions, so we did a small intervention in Libya. And the result is now that we have chaos in Iraq, chaos in Libya, and you know what? We're going to have chaos in Afghanistan. It's already growing. The casualties there are much bigger this year than they've been in the last few years. And Afghanistan is going to be the next basket case uh, as U.S. and allied troops pull out. The fact of the matter is these places are broken, and I don't think that America is going to stand aside and let them be broken. Uh, at some point, we're going to do something again. Because yes, we do see ourselves as the world's car carpenter and contractor. I've never phrased it like <laughs> that, but I like the way that you Thank phrase you it. So we do much feel for we this have a moral responsibility to the whole world. Thank you, Professor. That's all the time we have for today. But thanks for this wonderful interview where we're talking to Professor Alan Cooperman discussing humanitarian interventions and who needs to bear the responsibility for their consequences. That's it for this edition of Sophie and Co. I will see you next time.